Hey guys, welcome to another IGCSE chemistry revision video. Today we're going to be covering, as you can see on the screen, the topic of stoichiometry. Now, I have just finished writing down all the notes on my website, www.freeexamacademy.com, and as you can see, it is quite comprehensive, so if you want to check that out, just visit the website, go under chemistry, under revision, and you'll find it there. But without further ado, let's begin. So this topic really was quite a challenge when I was studying IGCSEs and um, initially I think it's because I didn't quite grasp the concept of it. Once you do grasp the concept it becomes extremely easy so that's what I'm going to try to do for you guys in this video. It does require a lot of practice from, from your end. You do need to achieve um, or try attempt a lot of different questions to get the hang of it but you know you do need to have the foundations covered so without further ado we'll begin now so first of all you need to know how to construct the basic formula of a simple compound so to do this you need to know or understand the concept of valency which is basically how many electrons does an atom need to lose or gain to obtain a full outer shell so this is the periodic table that Cambridge will give you um, for your examinations Right, so you can see here that the, you've got groups. You've got group 1, which is column 1, group 2, column 2. It skips the middle here, which is transition metals you don't really need to know. And then it goes to group 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. We'll learn about the periodic table in a bit more detail later. But these columns or groups are really important because it tells you how many electrons these atoms within the group have in their outer shell. So beryllium, for example, is in group 2, therefore it has 2 electrons in its outer shell, whereas nitrogen has 5. Why that's important is because if you looked at my previous video, it means that you can determine what an atom needs to do in order to gain a full outer shell. For in terms, for example, in, in terms of nitrogen, it needs to gain 3 electrons because it has 5. So it just needs 3 more to achieve a full outer shell, which is a lot easier than losing 5 electrons. So non-metals, which is on the right side of the sort of a periodic table here, will tend to gain electrons to fulfill their atomic stability. Whereas on the left hand side here, for example, lithium, it's got one electron in its outer shell, so it'd rather lose one electron to make itself have a full outer shell. And the valency is important because it also gives you the charge of whatever you're looking at of the iron um, of the of the atom. For example, lithium here, if it turns from an atom to an iron, well, it's going to be losing one electron, so the charge is going to be minus one. For oxygen, for example, it's in group six, so it needs two extra electrons. When it gains those two electric electrons, then it's going to have a charge of minus two. This will become a bit more easier for you as you, you know, progress through the course. But anyway, what you need to understand is mainly the, the, the concept of valency, right? So group one, valency of one because it needs to lose one electron. Group seven, valency of your one also because it needs to gain one electron. So whether it's losing or gaining, the valency is what how many electrons need to be gained or lost in order to achieve a full outer shell and that's very very important. So the formula of a compound is simply obtained by swapping the valency numbers over okay, and cancelling if possible. For example, you have potassium oxide, uh, you've got the valency of 1 for potassium and 2 for oxygen. You swap the numbers and what you get is K2O, that is the formula for potassium oxide. Magnesium oxide, you have valency of 2 for magnesium and also oxygen has a valency of 2. You swap the numbers over but in this case you can cancel it out and if you can cancel, you must cancel. What that leaves is MgO. So that's fairly simple. So the second step is to be able to write simple equations, right? This skill will actually naturally be developed as you sort of progress through the course as you learn, you know, certain rules of different chemicals reacting with different other substances and things like that but here we'll focus on the idea of balancing equations because this is crucial so the total number of each type of atom in the left hand side of the equation has to equal the right hand side you can't just atoms can't disappear or be gained from one side to the other it has to be absolutely equal as you can see magnesium plus oxygen giving you magnesium oxide in this example you can see that the equation is not balanced we've got you've got two oxygens on the left hand side but only one oxygen on the right. So what can you do to fix this? Well you can't change the formula itself. You know that magnesium oxide has the formula of MgO. You can't simply just make it MgO2 to try to balance the equation. 
just to add an extra auction here. That's you you cannot do that. So, but what you can do is add numbers to the front of the compound or whatever it is. And so, for example, in this case, you can add a two in front of magnesium oxide, giving you two magnesiums on the right-hand side of the equation. So therefore, you have to add two onto the left-hand side. And when when you do this, you have a balanced chemical equation whereby you have you know an equal number of atoms of each particular element on both sides of the equation. And so these big numbers that you put in front actually represent the mole ratio. So every magnesium atom that is used in the equation, I suppose, or in the reaction, because it has a 2 in front and oxygen theoretically only has a 1 in front because it's got nothing there, it tells you that for every magnesium, because it's a 2 to 1 ratio, for every magnesium that is used, only half of oxygen is used. And we'll learn more about the mole ratios later, and this becomes very really important when you're doing calculations for stoichiometry. So, there's a couple of definitions that you need to get your head around. We've got the relative atonic, atomic sorry, mass. Uh, that's represented as the AR, and this is the average mass of the naturally occurring atoms on a relative scale whereby you know, carbon has a mass of 12 units. You don't, okay, so the, the definition itself is not really important, but what you do need to know here is that if you look at the periodic table, you've got the mass number. You should be familiar with mass number and proton number. We're talking about the mass number here. The mass number of the atom of that element is basically the relative atomic mass. That is key. So, what you then have is relative formula mass, which is basically if you have a compound like magnesium oxide, the relative formula mass is just the addition or the sum of all the different relative atomic masses inside the compound. In this case, you've got magnesium, which has you know an AR of 24, and oxygen, which has an AR of 16. So the relative formula mass of magnesium oxide is just the sum of all those, which is basically 24 plus 16, giving you 40 grams. Okay, now this is all relative. It's a relative mass, but it's important. And so magnesium oxide here has 40 grams. And why this is important is because one mole, okay, so one mole of any substance is, this, is basically defined as the amount of substance that contains 6, to the power, 6 times 10 to the power of 23 atoms, ions, or molecules within that substance, okay? And that specific number is called the Avogadro's constant. What's really important here, of course, is the idea that one mole of any particular substance will have the weight of the relative formula mass of that compound, okay? So for example, when we take a look at magnesium oxide here, one mole of MDO, okay, is defined as, you know, the amount of substance that contains 6 times 10 to the power of 23 magnesium oxide molecules, and altogether that one mole will weigh 40 grams, and as you can see, 40 grams is the relative formula mass, okay? One mole of magnesium will contain 6 times 10 to the power of 23 magnesium atoms, it will weigh 24 grams, okay, which is just the weight of an, a, a magnesium atom. Okay, which is the relative atomic mass. Um, oxygen, okay, they're always in molecules. O2 will contain 6 times 10 to the power of 23 molecules again. It'll weigh 32 grams because the relative formula mass is 16 plus 16, which is 32. So please get your head around this because this is extremely important. So when we start to look at mole calculations, right? So all the calculations that we'll be doing will be about moles, and this is the concept that we talked about before. Okay, the one mole will be the mass, well one mole has the mass of the relative formula mass or the relative atomic mass if there is just a single atom. Okay, so there are three main equations that you need to know, and it's these three here, and you need to be able to memorize this and be able to rearrange them off by heart. You need to be very familiar with these three equations. Also, you do need to know the concept of mole ratios. We briefly touched on this before, but a mole ratio is the ratio between the amounts and moles of any two compounds involved in a chemical reaction. So, you know, if just take a look at two separate you know, substances here. For example, magnesium and magnesium oxide. If one magnesium mole is used, then also one magnesium oxide mole will be formed in this particular equation because the ratio between magnesium and magnesium oxide is 1 to 1 or 2 to 2, which cancels out to 1 to 1. 
and uh, you'll sort of understand this a bit more when we go through certain examples. But for now, please make sure that you understand these three formulas. So we're going to go through the use of each of these formulas one by one. So in terms of mass calculations, okay, so the basics are that, you know, let's take a look at some examples using um, the basics here. So one mole of water, which is H2O, how many grams is that going to be? You need to think to yourself, well, okay, so we talked about one mole uh, having the relative formula mass, so the relative formula mass of H2O is just the added atomic masses, which is 18, because you add 2 to 16. Uh, 2 moles of magnesium oxide will simply be magnesium oxide's relative formula mass, which is 24 plus 16, which is 40, but you times that by 2, because 40 is the mass of 1 mole, you've got 2 moles here, so that's 80 grams, and you get the gist. So, let's take a look at a bit more of a difficult example. So it says, calculate the mass of magnesium oxide that is formed when 3 grams of magnesium reacts with excess oxygen. So I've wrote down a couple of steps here. First of all, you need to have a balanced equation. Then, you calculate the moles of whatever substance that is in question. In this, you know, in this equation, we're talking about magnesium. Okay, so they say 3 grams of magnesium. So you need to figure out, well, how many moles is 3 grams of magnesium? And uh, then step three is to review what the mole ratio is, right? Because they're asking for magnesium oxide. So then you take a look at the mole ratio between magnesium and magnesium oxide to calculate how many moles of magnesium oxide was formed from the reaction. Once you know how many moles of magnesium oxide was formed, then you simply use the equation that we talked about before, this equation here, to figure out what the final mass of the magnesium oxide was. So therefore, let's go through those steps one by one. You've got the balance equation, and so if you want to calculate the moles of magnesium, all you need to do is chuck it into the formula, and uh, the, the, the equation becomes 3 grams divided by the relative formula mass of magnesium, which is 24. Uh, so you get 0 0.125 moles of magnesium uh, that was used in the reaction. So if 0 0.125 moles of magnesium was used, then you'd figure out the mole ratio, right? So you've got the number 2 in front of magnesium, you've also got the number 2 in front of magnesium oxide, giving you a ratio of directly 1 to 1. What that means is, since 0 0.125 moles of magnesium was used, 0 0.125 moles of magnesium oxide has been formed. Now that you know that 0 0.125 moles of you know, magnesium oxide has been formed, you basically rechuck it back into this formula, re you rearrange everything, and you get 0 0.125 times uh, the relative formula mass, and that gives you 5 grams, which is the mass of magnesium oxide that was formed. So the main key point here, guys, is to initially calculate the moles and take a look at the mole ratio, uh, take a look at the moles of whatever substance that was formed, and then convert that back into mass. And that's all done using this simple formula, as we took a look at before. So second of all is gas calculations. The basics of gas calculations is there's a really important uh, idea here that one mole of any gas, right? It doesn't any gas will take up 24 decimeters cubed of volume at room temperature and pressure. Okay, so every single gas behaves this way. So that means one mole of oxygen will take up 24 decimeters cubed. One mole of chlorine gas will take up 24 decimeters cubed every single gas will take up 24 decimeters cubed, um, one mole of that particular gas that is. Okay, so if that was the case, then we can actually figure out the moles of any gas just by knowing how much volume it's occupying and vice versa. So, therefore, we have derived this formula whereby the moles of any you know, particular gas at room temperature and pressure, of course, is the volume of the gas divided by 24, because 24 is how much one mole would occupy. Remember, decimeters cubed is 1,000 centimeters cubed, and quite often they will tell you, uh, they may say that the volume is, you know, whatever in centimeters cubed, so you always have to divide it, or, you know, you always have to convert it back to decimeters cubed before applying this equation. 
So let's take a look at an example. It's actually very similar to what we took a look at before. So the example says calculate the volume of oxygen at room temperature and pressure required to burn 1.4 grams of butene. Great. So 1.4 grams of butene. We take a look at the balance equation here and we think, well, 1.4 grams of butene, how many moles is that? We always want to think about the moles, not the mass, right? So 1.4 divided by the relative formula mass of butene, which is, I suppose, 12 times 4 from the carbons and 1 times 8 from the hydrogen, giving you 0 0.025 moles of butene that was used in the chemical reaction. The mole ratio here is 1 to 6. For every mole of butene, you get 6 moles of oxygen being used. What that means is if 0 0.025 moles of butene were used, then 6 times that would have been used in terms of oxygen. So you simply times 0 0.025 by 6 and you get 0 0.15 moles of oxygen. Now that you have the moles of oxygen, you can actually calculate the volume using the, uh, the equation before. So 0 0.15 times 24, okay, so this is a rearranged form of the equation, obviously, because now you want volume, so volume is moles times 24. So the moles is 0 0.15, you times that by 24, you get 3.6 decimeters cubed of oxygen. That is the volume of oxygen that is required to burn 1.4 grams, okay, of butene. The third one is solution calculations, whereby the, you know, the formula is moles of the solid or, you know, whatever it is, is the concentration times volume. Take a look at this example here. Calculate the volume of sodium hydroxide concentration of 0 0.16 needed to neutralize sulfuric acid, which has 20, 20 centimeters cubed and uh, 0 0.2 moles per decimeters cubed. So, of course, this is the concentration, this is the volume of sulfuric acid. So, initially, immediately, immediately you, can see, you can see that you can calculate the moles of sulfuric acid. Okay, so, what is the moles of sulfuric acid then? Okay, so you apply this equation here and you get concentration times volume. So, 20 divided by 1000, because this is in centimeters cubed, you want to convert that to decimeters cubed. 20 divided by 1000, you times that by 0 0.2, which is the concentration, and you get 0 0.004 moles of hydrochlor uh, sorry, um, hydrogen sulfate. Okay, which is a sulfuric acid. And so here, the mole ratio between sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide, which is NaOH, is 1 to 2. Meaning for every mole of hydrogen sulfate, you will need 2 moles of sodium hydroxide to neutralize it. So 0 0.004 moles of sulfuric acid, you times that by 2, meaning you need 0 0.008 moles of sodium hydroxide. But the question isn't asking you how many moles of sodium hydroxide you need, it's asking for the volume. So what you need to do is rearrange the equation, so therefore, uh, if you're looking for volume, it's moles divided by concentration. They give you the concentration, which is 0 0.16. All you need to do is 0 0.08 divided by 0 0.16, giving you 0 0.05 decimeters cubed or 50 centimeters cubed, which is the volume of NaOH or sodium hydroxide that is required to neutralize that specific amount of sulfuric acid. So thanks for watching guys, that is it for today. It is a fairly confusing topic, but I uh, hope that this has simplified it a little bit for you. As always, please like, share and subscribe. Visit my website for more notes and I'll see you in the...